That was the way of the sporting road user a hundred years ago. The old penny farthing. But nobody who wants to get anywhere today would give even a farthing for it. And why should they? Today is the age of power. And power needs to be used to the best advantage. Even the bicycle in its modern form demonstrates the idea of mechanical advantage. With its gear and chain drive designed to make effective use of the energy of the human power unit. In effect, the chain wheel and sprocket of a bicycle corresponds to the gear wheel and pinion of a parallel shaft gear. This is, of course, the basic type of gearing used to gain mechanical advantage in all kinds of machines, small and large, for power transmission and speed conversion. For a long time, it has been standard practice to use parallel shaft gears for coupling such prime movers as steam turbines, diesel engines, electric motors and gas turbines, to all kinds of industrial and marine machinery. But where high powers are concerned, the parallel shaft gear raises problems. Problems of space and weight, and the limitation of pitch line velocity. Problems of production and cost. That is why more and more industries are now turning to another type of gear altogether, the epicyclic gear. This gearing principle has been used for many years in bicycles, cars, and other forms of transport. But only recently has it been made practical for large power loads. The basic characteristic of an epicyclic gear is that the axis of one or more of its wheels moves around the fixed axis of another wheel, which may itself either be stationary or rotating about its own axis. In practice, the gear has three or even more planet wheels grouped round a sun wheel. There's an outer ring called the annulus with internal gear teeth engaging with the planet wheels. The planet wheel shafts are supported by a planet carrier. The black outer ring is merely a bearing for this model. Now, if the annulus is fixed, rotation of the sun wheel drives the planet wheels round and the planet carrier rotates in the same direction as the sun wheel, but at a lower speed, thus giving speed reduction or speed increase as required. Such gearing is suitable for ratios between 3 to 1 and 12 to 1. Conversely, if the sun wheel is fixed, rotation of the annulus drives the planet wheels round, and the planet carrier rotates in the same direction as the annulus but at a slightly reduced speed. This move is suitable for ratios between 1.2 to 1 and 1.7 to 1. There's a third way in which this form of gearing can be used, though it's not truly epicyclic. In this case, the planet carrier is fixed. Rotation of the sun wheel drives the planet wheels as idlers, and the annulus rotates in the opposite direction to the sun wheel but at a lower speed. This system can be used for ratios between 2 to 1 and 11 to 1. Amongst the advantages of epicyclic gears are the savings of weight and space which come about because the load on the sun wheel is transmitted at no fewer than three points where its teeth engage with the planet wheels. Therefore, each tooth engagement carries only one third of the total load. By comparison, the pinion of a parallel shaft gear has to be considerably larger than the sun wheel of an epicyclic gear, because in the parallel shaft gear, the entire load is transmitted by one tooth only at a time. Moreover, the larger pinion needs a larger gear wheel, entailing extra weight and space. Another advantage is that because the components are smaller, for a given degree of rotation, the actual distance traveled by the teeth is smaller. So the pitch line velocity is lower, and lower pitch line velocity means lower tooth friction losses. In fact, uh, when the planet carrier rotates in the same direction as the sun wheel or annulus, as the case may be, the relative pitch line velocity is less than the actual pitch line velocity, and tooth friction losses may amount to as little as one third of those of the parallel shaft gear of the same ratio. But to turn theoretical advantages into reality, the load sharing by the planet wheels must in fact be balanced. In practice, 
This has usually been the stumbling block, because gear tooth errors, as small as one ten thousandth of an inch, can cause grave trouble. Suppose a planet wheel has just one tooth that is imperfect. Each time it engages with either annulus or sun wheel, the loads will fluctuate. It's clear that this uneven load sharing would be intolerable in high power, high speed applications. So, working on this problem, a German engineer, Wilhelm Gustav Stokist of Munich, devised a floating annulus with enough flexibility to deflect a certain amount under the tooth loads, thus absorbing any minor inaccuracies and ensuring equal load sharing between the planets. The deflections which occur are actually minute and the stresses induced are far below those which might cause trouble from fatigue. But this drawing shows in a very greatly exaggerated way the principle of floating flexibility. The way ahead was now clear, and in close consultation with the inventor, a well-known British engineering firm, Allen's of Bedford, interested itself in the development and production of a gear embodying this principle. The Allen Sturkey epicyclic gear. One of a series of models ranging up to 15,000 horsepower, this particular gear is for use with a 550 kilowatt steam turbo generator converting 9,000 revs per minute to 1,800. Parallel shaft gears built for the same duty would require a much larger space than this compact gear. The 12-inch rule gives an indication of its overall dimensions. Stripped down completely and disregarding the casing, the gear consists of a sun wheel and three planet wheels of the double helical type. Three white metal-faced planet wheel spindles and the planet carrier. The planet carrier connects with the low-speed shaft. There are two annulus rings, each with internal and external teeth. The external teeth engage with a double gear tooth type coupling. This in turn engages with a tooth type flexible coupling, which is connected to the gear case. Similarly, there's a coupling sleeve with internal teeth at one end and external at the other for coupling the sun wheel to the high-speed member through a coupling flange. The thin annulus and the special annulus and sun wheel couplings give the gear its characteristic floating flexibility. It will be noticed that none of these components is particularly large. This is an important factor in production. The general machining and gear tooth forming require at least as high a standard of accuracy as in other types of gearing. But the smaller components make it possible to attain such standards more readily, since many of the problems associated with the production of larger gears are avoided. Very accurate hardened sun and planet wheels are produced, first by shaping the teeth, and then following this with tooth shaving. The components are then hardened by nitriding, a method of hardening that introduces none of the distortion troubles associated with other forms of hardening requiring quenching as part of the operation. It is unnecessary to carry out any after work on the teeth subsequent to nitriding. The inspection which each gear receives, both during and after production, confirms the success of this technique. It's interesting to see in the gear inspection department a comparison between the distortions occurring in two comparable gears, one carburized and the other nitrided. 
This testing machine records the distortions in graph form. The wheel being tested here is nitrided, and this is the graph produced. Each vertical division on the paper represents one ten thousandth of an inch, and this trace of helix angles shows no deviation exceeding one ten thousandth. Compare this with the trace for an exactly similar wheel that has been case hardened. Here the distortion is ten times as great. Quite clearly, some afterwork such as grinding would be needed on the case hardened job, whereas an excellent finished result is secured by nitriding. In fact, there's a double advantage in this technique of nitriding. Apart from cutting down the number of processes, it contributes to better design and performance since it enables compact double helices to be used in the gear. Use of double helices, which incidentally is covered by Turkish patents, eliminates the end thrust and end thrust bearing difficulties associated with single helical gears and the excessive noise sometimes associated with spur gears. Elimination of the need for grinding to correct the hardening distortion means that the gap between the helices can be small since there is no need to allow room to accommodate the grinding wheel. Consequently, overall length and weight are reduced and efficiency increased. Each gear tooth component manufactured here is registered in a complete inspection record. This certifies the composition and hardness of the material used and records the details of all checks of tooth profile, helix angle, pitch accuracy and final hardness after hardening. This procedure applies not only to epicyclic gear components, but to gear components of all kinds, including parallel shaft gears, which of course are still the most suitable for many applications. The annulus differs from the sun and planet wheels in the production technique employed because hardening is seldom necessary. The reason for this is that the stress between internal and external teeth is much less than between external teeth running together. Instead of being hardened, therefore, the annulus is cut from suitably heat-treated carbon or alloy steel forgings. Care is taken not to distort the ring when clamping into the machine table so that the teeth are always cut in a free condition. Naturally, the same standards of tooth accuracy are insisted on and inspection is equally as meticulous as for external gears. The spindles with a directly applied surface of white metal are used as bearings in the ground and polished bores of the planet fields. Such spindles ensure that in service there is no reversal of load on the white metal as would be the case if bushes were fitted in the board of the planet wheels. This important design feature also makes it easier to produce the pitch line of the teeth concentric with the bearing surface. Although the flexible annulus will compensate for small inaccuracies, it's essential that the spacing of the spindle bores in the planet carrier and their parallelism should be of the highest order. To make sure of this, a jig borer of the high precision type is used. Another requirement is that the planet carrier be as rigid as possible. This component is normally cast, except when it's to be integral with the low speed shafts when it's made of forged steel. Before assembly, each planet carrier and all shafts are dynamically balanced to eliminate unbalanced centrifugal forces. The balance is adjusted in the first place by applying temporary weights on the light side. Afterwards, the necessary weight of metal is drilled out opposite.
It's in the assembly that the accuracy of all preceding processes is demonstrated. The methods of manufacture used ensure that all components can be assembled without any fitting and that the finished job will run satisfactorily. So far, the only bearings that have been mentioned are these for the planet wheels. It's a unique feature of the Turkish gear that the high-speed sun wheel needs no bearings, being flexibly coupled to the high-speed member. In consequence, this gear has no high-speed bearing losses, which in parallel shaft gearing may be considerable. Because of the accurate machining, no more than a moderate pressure is needed to drive home the planet spindles with their white metal bearing surfaces. A later stage of assembly shows that the annulus rings are locked in correct engagement with the planet wheels and the double gear tooth coupling rings simply by the use of split rings. With the addition of the low speed shaft bearing, which may in many cases form one of the two bearings of the low speed member, assembly is near completion. Little now remains but to give the gear its running tests, and then it will be ready for a long life on the job. An Allen steam turbo generator, one of several built for the Oriana and other ships of the Orient line, demonstrates its value in power generating applications. Allens have been making electrical machinery since the 1890s. This one is rated at 1,750 kilowatts and is driven by a 2,500 horsepower steam turbine. One of their many types, ranging up to 10,000 horsepower. The two units are coupled by a 12 to 1 epicyclic gear. Nearby, a similar set has been completed and is running on test. The compact proportions of the gear in relation to the main units are immediately obvious. An important factor in marine applications where space is always at a premium. That's why the Canadian Pacific Liner, Empress of Britain, uses Allen's Turkey epicyclic gears in Allen DC turbo generators, converting 7,000 RPM 600 rpm for an output of 1,200 kilowatts. During the Second World War, there were items of Allen auxiliary equipment throughout the Royal Navy, and the tradition is being maintained. More recently, the lightweight and reliability of Turkish gearing has benefited in marine propulsion. This fast patrol boat, designed and built by Vospers of Portsmouth, is capable of over 50 knots. It relies on Allen's Turkish reverse reduction gears to transmit 3,500 horsepower from Bristol Sidley gas turbines to each of its three propellers. And speaking of gas turbines, Allen's make these as well. And the company is now helping to solve further problems of space with these powerful and compact prime movers. A good example of this is provided by five gas turbine generating sets of 350 kilowatts output which have been built for the Alfred Holt Blue Funnel Line. The 15,000 RPM of the turbine is reduced to 1,500 through the epicyclic gear and the lightweight prime mover and compact gearing permit installation in deck houses, thus reducing the space needed for the engine room. But Allen activities are by no means confined to marine applications. Take the Thames Sugar Refinery of Tate and Lyles at Silvertown, for instance. Their bar house provides a case in point. Here they have installed a 5,000 horsepower Allen steam turbine to help with their heavy power demands. This operates at 9,500 revolutions per minute and drive a 3,500 kilowatt alternator at 1,500 RPM. The transmission unit is the Allen epicyclic gear, giving the required reduction of six and a third to one. Once again, the small space needed by the gear is plain to see. 
no other form of gearing could be contained in such a compact casing. Nor is the use of these epicyclic gears confined to Allen plant alone. For example, in Lincoln at the Ruston Hornsby factory, they've already fitted more than a hundred of these gears into their own 1,000 kilowatt gas turbo alternators for service in many industries and many lands. Revving at 6,000 RPM, the gas turbine transmits its power through the epicyclic gear to turn the alternator at 1,800. In common with many other users, Rustons have found that these gears can be relied upon for a long life with minimum maintenance. If dismantling and inspection should be required, to meet statutory regulations for instance, it should be kept to a minimum to avoid the introduction of dirt into the working parts. The job presents no special difficulties, however, when done systematically. After the gear case cover has been removed, the first thing is to remove the split ring from the high-speed coupling flange and disengage the coupling sleeve. When removing the planet carrier, it's important to replace one bolt temporarily in position to retain the planet carrier while the other bolts and dowels are removed. The next operation is to remove the split rings securing the annulus coupling ring. After withdrawing the temporary bolt, the whole assembly can then be taken out. The entire operation can be performed in 45 to 90 minutes, according to the size of gear, and the components are then free for inspection. Reassembly takes no longer. This double helical epicyclic gear, embodying the now well-known Sturkic principle, is just one of a range of products made by Allen's of Bedford, whose mechanical and electrical engineering experience is extensive and long established, including steam and gas turbines, electrical machinery, diesel engines, pumping plants, switchboards and control gear. Allen's Turkish epicyclic gears have proved their value to users of power machinery generally, whether in the simple form that has been described or designed as multi-speed gears or coupled together to achieve higher ratios if required. Affording as they do a useful and efficient addition to the existing methods for gaining mechanical advantage, these gears are to be found in practical use in both marine and land-based applications all over the world. Thank you.